distinguished guests, my fellow countrymen. Only in America could it happen. For 70 years, a young nation had struggled with growing pains. The issue of slavery appeared, became more heated, and exploded into a major crisis. Reasonable men succumbed to emotions, and in doing so, they ignored the one thing, the only thing, that holds a democracy together, namely, the spirit of compromise. And so in 1861, the United States ceased to be. What followed was the bloodiest and most tragic four years in our heritage. Men of North and South, each fighting for the America they loved, spilled blood and sacrificed life in a terrible, terrible war. It was a conflict of viciousness and valor, determination and destruction. Mm. Civil wars are the worst of struggles because no matter on which side you are fighting, the enemy is your fellow citizen and the devastation you inflict is on your common country. Further, when the two sides are fighting for absolutes, one for union and the other for independence, the war is not going to end until one side is crushed, materially, physically, mentally, permanently. And the atmosphere upon surrender is usually one filled with vindictiveness and subjugation. Only in America could it happen. Because that's not what happened here at Appomattox 150 years ago on this day. Over three million men had borne arms in the Civil War, but two men alone would determine if that war would transform history and bring the, the country back to Gower again. Now, so much has been written of what Generals Robert Lee and Ulysses Grant did here. Yet, as we gather today to pay common tribute, a greater understanding might be gained from what those two officers achieved here by looking at what they did not do at that Palm Sunday in 1865. Hmm. Lee could have followed the course, the natural course, of a civil war. One of the, his own subordinates suggested it. Held the Army, Confederate Army, to disperse General Porter Alexander Begley. Let the men scatter into the hills and woodlands. Fight as guerrillas, ambushing, looting, burning. Maintain a smoldering war that will eventually sap the Northern will to resist. We can win, Alexander argued, by not losing. Lee shook his head. That was not his idea of the future. No, Lee said, we must consider the country as a whole. If I took your advice, the men would be without rations and under no control of officers. They would become mere bands of marauders. We would bring on a state of affairs it would take the country years to recover from. No, Lee concluded, I must go to General Grant and surrender myself and take the consequences of my acts. Mm. Now, Sam Grant had a choice here at Appomattox. He had done what other generals had failed to do for three years. He had at last brought the legendary Gray Fox to bay. Lee was surrounded. Grant could rightfully charge him with treason. Grant could humiliate him publicly. Grant could force him to pay painfully for the thousands of Union casualties that Lee had inflicted over the past three years. Lee could have sent all of the Confederates to prison, and some of them to the gallows. Yep. The shattered South was helpless in preventing any of those probabilities. But Grant himself had known personal defeat for much of his life. He could empathize with how Lee felt. And Grant, like Lee, had a sense of history and the judgments that come from the future. 
they tell a story that, if not true, ought to be. <laughs> so we'll assume it's true. A month earlier, President Lincoln had visited Grant at his city point headquarters, now Hopewell. The two conferred on the climactic campaign about to get underway. As Lincoln walked up the gangway to the ship, taking him back to Washington, Grant, who was standing on the shore and munching on one of his cigars, said, Mr. President, what do you want me to do when I catch him? And Lincoln quickly responded, let him up easy. Let him up easy. Wow. And so the meeting between the two Army commanders began that Sunday afternoon in the front hollow of Wilma McLean's home. And Grant opened with idle conversation, and an anxious Lee asked that they discuss the possible surrender of his forces. The Virginia commander was visibly surprised at the leniency of Grant's terms. Even today, they seem totally incompatible in the face of the destruction of life and property following four years of the most intense warfare. Mm -hmm. Confederates with horses could keep their mounts for the spring plowing back home. Officers could retain their sidearms for peaceful purposes. Some 25,000 rations would be issued at once to Lee's starving forces. And thereafter, Southern soldiers would sign paroles, and they would go home, and as long as they did not break the law, they were not to be disturbed by any federal officials for any presumed reason. A grateful Lee stated that the terms would be helpful and, he said, will do much toward the reconciliation of our people. Both Lee and Grant wanted a bad war to be followed by a good peace. Lee's decision spared the nation from the hollow of a guerrilla warfare that would have forever shattered any dreams of union. And Grant's generous offer made it difficult to hang Lee and other Southerners in any sort of post-war retribution. In that springtime afternoon, two notable service officers served their country well. Until April 9, 1865, the word Appomattox had no meaning. It belonged to a river and a county. But after that Palm Sunday, Appomattox would be a great word and it announced the moment when sunset and sunrise came together. Of course, civil wars must be ended by civil authorities, not military figures. Genuine peace would be a long time coming. The America you and I know was born in 1865, not 1787. Three constitutional amendments in rapid-fire fashion brought momentary, momentary political turmoil to a restored union trying to find cohesion. Nine years of military occupation of the South bred an age of hate in many quarters. And the struggle for civil rights produced frustrations long before progress eventually began. American industry breastfed by the demands of civil war would expand with a dramatic surge that made the new Union a world power by the turn of the century. In contrast, the old South and all that it encompassed disappeared in the flames and ashes yep. of a civil war. And it is well that the Southern attempt at independence was unsuccessful. Otherwise, we would have become a balkanized continent without the strength of a great nation. Global democracy today would be surely less secure because there would have been no all-powerful United States to pave and point the way. Five years after Appomattox, Robert Lee became the first great Civil War figure to cross over the river. Yet his conciliatory leadership lived far beyond his lifetime. Lee demonstrated indelibly that we cannot live in the past. 
we learn from the past in order to make the future more promising and secure and beneficial for us all. Time also proved a great healer. As the post-war years slipped by, ex-soldiers grew older and with that more compassionate. And soon fantasy began to take over where fact was. And increasingly, the vestiges of the war reminded Americans of their common bonds rather than the one time they disagreed so drastically. The new union and the lost cause marched along parallel paths until age and mutual respect led to a juncture of the two, a junction that marked at last the nation at peace with itself and joined in a single unity. Our history is a living presence for good or ill. It cannot be commemorated once and then set aside for another decade or half century. The past is always with us, whether we acknowledge it or not. And history is also the greatest teacher you will ever have. We gather here this weekend to mark the end of a great struggle waged for the betterment of mankind. Mm -hmm. If nothing else on this occasion, we should feel a moral obligation to remember those who were swept into that conflict. We need especially to acknowledge 750,000 farmers and clerks, students and laborers, who for various reasons put on a uniform, marched off to battle, and never came home. They sacrificed their ambitions so others would not have to sacrifice the other else. And we need to hold dear in memory the grief-stricken mothers, mm. the heartbroken wives and sweethearts who did not lose life, but they lost the love that gives meaning to life. If only those men and women could know that their sacrifices once and for all would reunite the states. If only they could know that the world would be so much better because of their last full measures of devotion. They do not know these things, but you do. And that is what Americans of every age and background need to honor, not merely at the end of these sesquicentennial observances, but for as long as we love our country. <laughs> the sacrifices of soldiers north and south are our common inheritance. Let us always remember with heartfelt thanksgiving who they were and what they did. Fervently, let us hope that with God's blessings, Appomattox will forever be the symbol of a nation, undivided and indivisible. God bless and thank you.